And as we start looking at um, what might be quite a familiar passage for um, a lot of us, um, I want to start by saying that I think it's a particularly, despite its familiarity, it's a kind of particularly interesting and kind of engaging and unusual passage. Um, and I think there's a few reasons for that. One is that um, it's unique in, uh, across all of the Gospels. So lots of um, the stories in Luke's Gospel um, appear in other stories of Jesus, uh, other biographies of Jesus in the New Testament. Um, but this one is only here, only in Luke. So straight, straight off the bat, um, I think that makes it unique in some way. Another reason is that um, in Acts, um, the sequel to Luke's Gospel, um, which is also in the New Testament, Luke says that um, the risen Jesus appeared to uh, many people over a period of about 40 days after his resurrection. And Luke's claim as author is that he talked to um, lots, of, lots of witnesses to Jesus. So he could have chosen um, lots of different stories about Jesus after his resurrection to include in his gospel. Um, but he chose this one. So why is that? You know, there'll be lots of um, scenes that are on the cutting room floor so to speak, but this one made um, the final edit. So why choose this story? I think together those two observations um, mean that there's something here in this passage that in Luke's eyes is key to understanding Jesus. Something essential to him is revealed here, as familiar as this passage might be. As I say, all of Luke's gospel is worth listening to, but there's something here that's unique. And a final reason it's kind of intriguing and engaging in an unusual way is perhaps to state the obvious, that um, it describes a man who has died and come back from the dead. And um, straight off the bat, you might be thinking, well, obviously that doesn't happen. Obviously this is absurd. And if that is you, firstly, um, thank you for being here uh, and for listening. And can I invite you just for 20 or 25 minutes or so, just to sort of park your um, scepticism uh, and kind of go on a, a journey with us as the disciples go on a journey um, with Jesus. If for no other reason than, as I hope I've, I've said, um, and not to labour the point too much, but I do think this is kind of an interesting and dramatic story it's a good story, even if you don't believe it. And the reason it's quite dramatic is because actually it's a story about stories. Or, to put it another way, a story about truth. It's a narrative where two different, um, two different stories kind of come up against one another. The disciples tell one story, and then Jesus tells another one. And that's a kind of quite a compelling recipe for a drama, a conflict of stories. It's why so many of the, um, the dramas that kind of engage us, whether fictional or real, is uh, it's why so many of those are court cases. Um, you think of, for instance, The Killer Mockingbird, or Twelve Angry Men, or um, The Trial of O.J. Simpson. Even perhaps most recently, um, Rebecca Vardy and Colleen Rooney. You know, we love a contest over the truth. And that is what we have here. But this contest over the truth, it doesn't happen in a courtroom um, between bitter rivals or enemies. It happens on a journey, on a road. And the dialogue isn't between lawyers witnesses, judges, the cast of a, a court case. It's between strangers, at least strangers to begin with. And this is how it starts, verse 13. If you've got the passage open in front of you, that would help. This is verse 13. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. 
Now, just last week, we celebrated Easter, where we remember the resurrection of Jesus, which is an occasion of of great joy, and rightly so. But as we start looking at this passage, we kind of need to go back a bit to sort of re-enter the emotional space that the disciples find themselves in. It's a couple of days after they've seen Jesus crucified and before he's, he's been risen. And we read in a moment that their faces are downcast. And that's because they, most likely these two men have followed Jesus for months, possibly even the better part of three years. And their hopes have been growing gradually over that time as they have watched this strange, beautiful, loving, powerful, merciful, just, perfect man with a message of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. They've watched him perform wondrous things that they've never seen before. And they've listened to him offer a kind of hope that they've never heard before. They've watched him grow and grow in reputation, stoke controversy. And at the moment of the Jewish festival of the Passover, a great national religious celebration, they've seen the man that they've come to love as a friend and a brother, betrayed by one of his own, handed over to the Romans by the Jewish authorities, tortured and put to death in the most horrific and humiliating way that humans have ever devised for killing criminals. So these two men on the road have endured what I think today we would fairly call a trauma, a a traumatic tragedy. They are distraught, they're confused, they're uncertain. Because Jesus, the one in whom they had begun to hope, has, to their mind at least, for the time being, failed. But that very Jesus, resurrected, comes back to them. Listen to verse 15. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. I think about what's happening here. As we said, the disciples are in despair, but Jesus is with them. They don't even know it. As yet, they can't see him. They don't understand him. They don't fully grasp his plan. Their trust in him is probably quite shaky. But Jesus draws near to them. He is with them. Don't let this image pass you by. Though they can't see him, the resurrected Jesus is with his disciples in the midst of their sorrow. And there's a lot to come in these verses about suffering, specifically Jesus' suffering. But right now, it's these two disciples who are enduring difficulty and uncertainty, a sadness, a vulnerability, a pain they didn't foresee, something something perhaps that many of us have experienced. But it's in that situation that Jesus draws near to them. And he says to them, as he draws near, what are you discussing together? What a strange, almost offensive thing that would have been for the disciples to hear. See, Jesus' death wasn't just an item of local news. It was the story in Jerusalem, that Passover. Everyone knew about it. Crowds had watched Jesus enter Jerusalem on a donkey, and then they had seen him condemned to death and executed. So what's sort of happening here on the road to Emmaus is a bit like back in uh, September 2022, Someone is walking along the banks of the Thames, looking at um, people queuing to see the Queen in state, soaking up the atmosphere, 
and says to a passerby, something happened? Someone died? That's what this is like. It's shocking. And it's shocking enough for uh, Jesus to have, to have to ask the question twice, because the first time he does, one of the disciples is so astonished that he scoffs. I think that's the tone of what's said in verse 18. Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened there in these days? He scoffs because he's shocked. And in some sense, we should be shocked, or at least surprised. Because what Jesus is doing here is strange, isn't it? There's no two ways about it. We're thinking, as soon as we see Jesus, when are you going to reveal yourself? When are you going to make yourself known? When are the disciples going to see you for who you really are? And perhaps in addition to that, why haven't you done so already? Why doesn't Jesus immediately, when he meets his disciples, say, it's me, it's Jesus, I'm back, rejoice. Why doesn't he do that? Well, perhaps it's because in the meantime, he's got something to say which is a crucial part of understanding the true meaning of his death and his resurrection. The resurrection which, as yet, these disciples haven't grasped. So, therefore, it might be worth us paying particular attention, I think, in the meantime, to the things that Jesus says before he reveals himself fully. But anyway, for the time being, Jesus remains unrecognized. And his sort of faux innocence, the questioning that he puts the disciples to, digs out for us a clearer sight of how they understand what's happened. And so they tell their story. The first story I mentioned, the disciples' story, the one that they're living in. This is verse 19. It's a story about Jesus of Nazareth. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and before all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And Cleopas goes on a bit beyond that. There's a bit more to it. The thing is that none of this story, none of what Cleopas says here, is by itself kind of inaccurate or incorrect. The information is okay. We know from reading Luke, if we have been reading Luke, that Jesus was a powerful prophet. He was crucified as a result of actions by both the Jewish authorities and the Roman government. And he was one that many had hoped would redeem Israel. And we saw, um, if you were here last week, in the previous verses, that some women who had followed Jesus um, witnessed something and then came to, uh, to tell other disciples of his um, that he was risen. And in verse 11, when these women reported it, we read that it seemed like nonsense to them. So none of the content of what Cleopas is saying here is, is inaccurate. But as it stands... It's wrong. Luke is showing us that there's a lot more to hear. And without the full story of what's happened in Jerusalem, the disciples are actually in the dark. So if you think that Jesus' suffering and death is the full story, the end of the story, then listen to what Jesus says next. This is his response to the disciples, verse 25. Jesus says, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. See, at this moment, the tables are turned. Just before, the disciples were shocked 
that this stranger on the road from Jerusalem had no idea about all that had gone on involving Jesus of Nazareth. And now it's the other way around. And Jesus, the very Jesus of Nazareth the disciples have been talking about, he is shocked by their slowness to grasp what's gone on, the truth of what's gone on. And the full irony of his earlier questions when he said, what are you talking about? What's been happening? The full irony is exposed because the truth is that he is the only one who does know what's gone on, who fully understands it. And the disciples' story falls well short of the truth. But let's go into, into Jesus' story in a bit more detail. It's, it's in the following verses that we, we, we get a summary of what Jesus says. Um, this is the second story that I mentioned. He takes them through the Hebrew Scriptures, what we now call the Old Testament. That's what the phrase Moses and the prophets means, in case you're wondering. And as Jesus does that, as he takes them through that story, he shows them everything in those stories about him, concerning himself. And there's a point for all of us here, which is a simple one. It's the same one that Jesus had for his disciples, which is that the way to read the Old Testament is through the lens of Jesus. And if that sounds a bit odd to you, that's, well, that's because that was Jesus' Jesus's own view. To use a phrase um, made popular by a podcast that some of you might know, Jesus believed that the Bible is a unified story which leads to him. It's ultimately all about Jesus, and it's the story of a lost people, a people walking in darkness, waiting for a a redeemer, for a saviour. There's this great sense of waiting across the Old Testament. And there are lots of figures who come up, and we wonder whether it's them. Is this the the saviour of Israel? Is it Moses? No. Is it Saul, the first king? Is it David? No. Is it Solomon, whose uh, wisdom uh, was was something about it, the like of which the world had never seen before? Was it him? No. Is it Jesus? Well, in response to that question, Cleopas, uh, one of the disciples, clearly thinks that the answer is also no. And why is that? Well, it's because Jesus suffered and died. And frankly, what sort of a redeemer, what sort of a king would die the death that Jesus did? And in a sense, we can kind of sympathize with Cleopas, can't we? It's not very powerful. It's not very triumphant. Is it? Particularly if, um, like Cleopas, you're a a Jew living in um, under under Roman occupation in the first century. You know, under that oppression, surely Israel is going to be rescued from that state of affairs by someone triumphant, someone who doesn't die the death of a criminal. Because in Cleopas's mind, and perhaps in in your mind. Um, death is, is the end. That's it. But Jesus' reply to that, Jesus' reply to that doubt is that the Messiah, or the Christ, it's the same word, just in Greek, the promised rescuer of God's people, had to suffer. And he had to die. It's not that his suffering was a sign of failure, as we might think. Rather, it's the confirmation of his kingship, and it's his path to glory. And that is why Jesus turns to the Old Testament. And he's doing nothing new, by the way. If you've read Luke all the way through it, Jesus is uh, engaging with and teaching the Old Testament. Whether it's uh, the first story about him um, in chapter 2, when he's at the temple... Uh, engaging with teachers of the law, or when in chapter 4 he's tempted by the devil and he quotes scripture, 
Or later, that same chapter, when he's at the synagogue in Nazareth, reading from the book of Isaiah, Jesus is always teaching the scriptures. It's a key, key part of his ministry. And he's, therefore, he's doing nothing new here with the disciples on the road. And that's why he can say to them, if they've been with him for months, however long, how foolish you are. Because he's been making this point all along. But it's not simply that the Old Testament is a story about Jesus. It's that until we grasp that truth, until we read the Old Testament in this way, we won't know Jesus fully. It's as though the disciples have sort of uh, walked into a a play about Jesus' death, and they've arrived late, they've arrived for the final scene. And they haven't seen all of the build-up all of the prophecies that frame Jesus' death. They haven't grasped everything that came before, and so they don't really understand what happened on that cross. But it's as Jesus walks along the road with them and teaches them the Old Testament, they begin to understand the story of the Old Testament. It's as they do that that they later say to one another, were not our hearts burning within us? Now it might, at this point, it's probably worth acknowledging, it might make some of us uneasy um, to hear kind of the Old Testament talked about in these terms. Um, We might find reading it quite uncomfortable, um, baffling, boring. But Jesus dismisses none of it. He says... It's all about him. And therefore, um, brothers and sisters, let's read the Old Testament. It's hard. Um, I know I know what that's like. But it's Jesus' story, and therefore it should be our story. And if we don't see that, if we don't read it like he did, then we won't understand Jesus in his fullness. We won't really grasp the story that he's telling And that's a big part of why the disciples don't recognize the risen Jesus, because they don't yet fully understand him and his mission. So, Jesus has been teaching them that the Messiah had to suffer and die, and he's been teaching them from the Hebrew Scriptures. But you might well reasonably ask, well, why? Why did he have to suffer and die? Only a few verses ago, back in chapter 2, Jesus um, has quoted from Isaiah 53. Um, No need to turn there now. Um, But do go go away and read that chapter. It's quite well known. You might recognize some of it. Jesus quotes from Isaiah 53 to describe himself. And I'm going to read some verses from uh, that chapter. This is Isaiah 53, starting at verse 4. Excuse me. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. See, the suffering that um, Jesus bore the slander, the betrayal, the condemnation, the torture, the death on the cross, and the just judgment of God was no accident. He bore all of that for us and for our healing and salvation. And again, perhaps that's another thing that sounds a bit odd and unsettling to you. But in truth, I can't think of a better way of demonstrating a greater love for someone. See, our sin is real. I think we know that all deep down. And the darkness in us can't just be hidden. It needs to be accounted for. It needs to be judged. But God himself, not some third party, God himself, in the person of Jesus, Jesus, 
the suffering servant, he takes his own judgment upon himself that we might live. It says in in John's Gospel, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. There was a well-known pastor who died last year who um, said this in a, in a book of his on, on marriage, actually. He says, the gospel is this. We are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. Yet, at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. And it's Christ's suffering in our place at the cross that achieves that for us. It's crucial to that gospel. And it's hard, um, I think, for us living today um, in the time and the place that we do to kind of appreciate the revolutionary weight of this because the story of a, a suffering hero or king has become so um, normalized for us. It's such a part of our culture that it's sort of almost the air we breathe. There's a few, in recent years, a few writers have kind of commented on this, not Christians necessarily, but a number of people have noticed um, or have observed this, people like Jonathan Sachs and Tom Holland. The story that we love and the stories that we love to tell are so often variations on this theme. You know, a hero or a heroine with a, um, an obscure history, their identity and their greatness is revealed through suffering, whether that's Oliver Twist or Harry Potter or um, some of you might have seen Dune in the cinemas recently. We love this story, the story of the suffering hero. And this is the original This is the original story. This is where it comes from. And it's revolutionary. So, can I encourage us not to grow cold to Jesus' death? So, Jesus, as I said, has taught the disciples, according to the scriptures, that the Messiah had to suffer and indeed die. But today, this Sunday, is is not Good Friday. We're one week on from Easter. And this passage is um, not just about Jesus' death, it's about his resurrection. So what about that? Well, there's a fairly common illustration, which you might have heard, so forgive me if so, but I do think it's quite apt at this point, which is about how if you're climbing a mountain, a big one, it's easy to look ahead and see, see a peak and think, Oh, that above us, we're nearly there. But as you arrive there, you realize, looking up, that in truth, that you've actually only crested a little hill and that there's something far, far greater, bigger and more glorious beyond you as you look up to the, to the mountain beyond. And I think, in some ways, that's perhaps a little bit like what the disciples felt as Jesus um, explained these things, as he walked them through the Old Testament, teaching them about the suffering king, I think there's a sense in which, as their hearts burn within them, the kind of clouds were parting. They begin to see further and more clearly before that the Messiah had to suffer and die because his mission was to save his people from their sin. So, Perhaps they're thinking, or perhaps Jesus' death wasn't quite the failure that they thought. Perhaps, after all, he needed to suffer, and his death wasn't a failure. So Jesus' story is beginning to kind of win out over theirs. Can you see that? Their understanding of things is being eclipsed by his true story of the suffering king. But this lesson that Jesus is teaching them takes um, quite some time. And after a day on the road, they're all tired. And Jesus um, is invited by these two disciples to stay with them. And it's at this point that we come to the 
kind of interesting episode of, of the bread, um, perhaps the most kind of intriguing and weird part of the passage. And it's at this point that um, I think it's worth saying that in the Gospel of Luke, um, meals and food and eating are significant. One scholar has said that in Luke, Jesus is almost always on his way to or from a meal. And when Jesus is at a meal, among other things, there's something important about him is revealed or clarified or articulated. That's always the case at meals in Luke's gospel. And there are two other occasions in Luke um, specifically where Jesus himself takes bread, breaks it, gives thanks or blesses it, and then shares it out. One is the feeding of the 5,000 in chapter 9, which is another well-known story. And immediately following that episode, Peter, one of, the, um, one of Jesus' disciples, confesses that he is the Christ for the first time. There's a significant lesson about Jesus has learned there. The second one is the Lord's Supper, only uh, a few chapters before, where Jesus' uh, death is kind of illustrated um, for the first time in a kind of dramatic way and instituted uh, as something for the church to um, celebrate together. See, a meal with Jesus, as I said, is a moment where something crucial about him is revealed or clarified. And the disciples on the Emmaus Road are kind of at a similar point. You know, they've been given a new story that replaces the one that they were living in. It's a story in which the Christ, they now see, had to suffer and die. And therefore, maybe Jesus wasn't a failure. Maybe his death wasn't the end. Perhaps it was always the plan. In fact, Jesus is beginning to look an awful lot like the Christ. The one who suffers and dies to win new life for his people. But if that is the case, how would we know uh, that he has triumphed? How would we know? After all, anyone can die. And that's what the cross was, right? It was the death of a, a common criminal. Surely the Christ would somehow have to kind of show that he's defeated death and prove that there is life for his people beyond the grave, free from sin, free from pain, from sickness, from fear. But how would he do that? How would we know? Well, listen to these words in verse 30. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from sight. Isn't that dramatic? I've tried to sort of bring it out there, kind of exaggerate it, but I really think it is drama. See, what's happened here is the the, the disciples have grasped that, as we said, the scriptures proclaim that Christ had to suffer and die. And as they grasp this, as they understand the true nature of, of Jesus' mission, Jesus himself opens their eyes through the breaking of the bread, somehow, and they see that he is risen. And up until this point, the disciples have been on a journey away from Jerusalem, away from the site of Jesus' death, but when they have their eyes opened, they turn back. They go back to Jerusalem, back towards Um, the place where Jesus died, as they understand the story afresh. And they go there to share news of the risen Jesus with uh, other disciples. And it turns out, actually, when they get there, it's a little detail in the passage, that um, others are testifying to Jesus' resurrection as well. Not just these disciples and not just the women. There are others who are seeing Jesus. And if you're you're not a believer, um, just note that what Luke is doing here is he's adding more and more people to the list of witnesses who've seen the risen Jesus. But for God's people, this moment where the disciples grasp his resurrection is a moment of joy. And that's to be our joy 
as well. When the disciples see, as they break bread with Jesus, the true story of his suffering and death and his resurrection and all that it won for us, they are changed. They see afresh for the first time. And that's their story. And this is our story too. It's our faith and our hope of life in Christ, his resurrection. And it's appropriate, therefore, that having read this story, in a, in a minute or so, we're going to uh, share a meal which Jesus himself instituted. We're going to remember his death. And we should all think deeply upon his death and his suffering, all of which was done in our place. But let's also rejoice. Rejoice in his resurrection, which he's revealed here on the road to Emmaus. It's the proof of his victory, and it's our hope. So as we eat together, let's put our hope in him and in the true story, the one that he's given us, of the Christ spoken of in the Hebrew Scriptures, who suffered and died in our place, and who is risen. Let me pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are risen. Thank you for this beautiful, strange, wonderful story um, of how you opened the disciples' eyes when you broke the bread. Pray, Lord, that you would keep our eyes open and that your resurrection would be our hope and joy in our life. Amen.